welcome to Slash Forward, and to another recap of a beloved horror movie. In this one, we're going to examine one of the most intricate and well-researched documentaries on human-paranormal-human relationships ever made, in the Peter Jackson-directed 1996 film The Frighteners. And in that regard, this film is information-rich, with the director's cut clocking in at two hours, and absolutely no shortage of story or action at any point in the movie. It follows the life of Frank Bannister, a gifted grifter who is in touch with the spirit realm, and even has friends therein who help initiate hauntings to keep his ghost extermination business in the black. But when his small town faces an inordinate quantity of unexplainable deaths, things begin to get hectic, even more so as in the course of attempting to protect those chosen to die. This string of natural deaths seems to harken back to a mass killing from 30 years prior, and also ties into his own wife's unfortunate death pursuant to a car accident just five Five years ago. What? How? Well, let's step through it piece by piece here, and then discuss some of the movie's merits and demerits in the hopes of ascertaining whether this would be the type of film that would bring you much enjoyment. Leave a comment to let me know which movie from the time period had the superior visual effects. This one, or Casper, or Jurassic Park. And if you're interested in learning more about ghost culture, be sure to check out some of the other videos on my channel. Let's get to it. We open on a dark and stormy night, zooming into a palatial mansion that's full of holes and screaming. A virginal young victim is pawed at by the walls and furniture, while an old crone shouts about the sins of the flesh and whatnot, eventually blasting the carpet monster wide open. Through journalistic narration, we then learn of a mysterious heart condition ripping through the countryside of Fairwater and claiming the lives of many healthy victims. Other than their exploding hearts, of course, the town is known for mass deaths from a murder spree 30 years prior, so the public is naturally connecting the two, since they are so similar. Our cub reporter Steve is tasked with hitting the pavement to get some juice from the residents. He ends up working the most recent funeral, where he looks down upon the Flim Flam men working the same funeral, like poor old Frank Bannister here. He just wants to connect families with their loved ones, but he's turned away, and discouraged, he takes a shortcut through the switchbacks and directly into some Jim Rat's lawn. Being a man of integrity, he leaves his card for billing purposes before driving off. We then return to the sanatorium from the opening, as Dr. Linsky pulls up. She's filling in for her colleague, Dr. Kamins, who is busy managing all the local deaths. Per her expertise, her patient Patricia needs stitches to properly close up her gash. But Patricia's not allowed to leave the property, and old lady Bradley does whatever she wants, given the tenuous circumstances of Patty's freedom. I can have her locked up anytime I want to. We're then treated to old-timey news footage of the previously mentioned Fairwater bloodbath. The accused is fittingly played by Abusey. The tragic event transpired at the sanatorium, and any potential motives for its cause have remained elusive. Patricia was implicated as an accomplice of Johnny Bartlett, but due to a lack of evidence, she was given prison over death row. This connection excites the ever-curious Lucy, but old Ray, yeah, he's too busy trying to get a lat spread like a king cobra. Anyway, Patricia served 30 years and was granted a conditional release five years ago. We're lucky we learned that, because Ray doesn't like his lady educating herself nor talking in general. He'd rather she focus her energies on readying herself for their upcoming anniversary dinner at Excalibur. But then suddenly, things start to get downright silly. Get me off! He's not able, but he does get her down. With continued phenomenological escalation, Lucy defies her husband's direct order and calls that psychic fruitcake Frank for help. Frank is able to quickly assess the cause of their troubles and offers to cleanse the home for only 450 bones, or by going even on the yard damage. Upon receiving the green light, Frank immediately gets to work, choosing the most unnerving possible method for spritzing around his holy water. His efforts eventually produce a little pouch of ectoplasm that can be easily evacuated through the garbage disposal. After giving the all clear, he's momentarily taken aback by the number 37 inscribed in flames on Ray's forehead. When Frank arrives home, we see that his grift is only a partial lie, in that he actually has a couple of friendly ghosts under his employ. Stuart and Cyrus don't seem to know anything about the significance of the number, and they also seem to have a bafflingly inconsistent relationship with solid matter. The next morning, Cyrus pops in to check on the status of Frank's taint and gets himself heel stomped down the drain. The ghosts are looking to have a meeting to confirm the requisite conditions for maintaining a happy ghost environment. 
This surely does not entail walking through them while they're talking, which is so disrespectful. He's too focused on making death his business to worry about their well-being. Then some crusty old fart comes in guns blazing, and it's revealed that ghosts may be able to die again from ghost bullets. In the evening, Frank then spends the remainder of his day pondering life as a house. The next morning, they get kicked into high gear when Frank gets a bank statement saying he needs to pay 15 k or they're going to take the frame of his house, so he really needs these turds to step up their scare game. The boys immediately get to work casing a new joint in the high rent district of town. They employ the help of the babies, who absolutely love levitating, much to Mommy's chagrin. Frank gets the call, and as he works to race around yet another funeral procession, the judge's warning that death seems to be present in the town falls on deaf ears. When Frank arrives, he starts right in on his usual bullshit. Unfortunately, he now has a feature in the Gazette, and so she'll be handling her flying baby problem on her own, thank you. He takes this up with the editor, who verbally excoriates him about his business practices, but also offers up no evidence to support her accusations. Getting nowhere, Frank heads out for some fresh air, and while sauntering down the sidewalk, he sees young Lucy drive by in a funeral procession. Shortly thereafter, he finds himself in crime to crotch contact with Ray. Turns out, Ray had a bit of an incident with a strange squeezing sensation in his chest. Afterward, he refused to follow the light because he believes himself too damn virile to be dead. Frank tries to reassure him that he did, and at Ray's request, grants him a ride to his own funeral. However, he warns that the cemetery is not a safe place. When they first arrive, Frank is accosted by the town's drill sergeant, who finds Frank's exploitation of the recently deceased to be distasteful, and he sees it as his duty to keep the supernatural community in line. While at the service, Ray finds himself awash in the paltry expressions of his good nature, before accidentally getting caught up in an existential nightmare. Sheriff Perry runs across Frank and confides that the FBI has been investigating the recent odd happenings. The hearts of the victims are all mushed up, but the arteries are clean as a whistle. Frank has to excuse himself to help Ray up, and then is begged to deliver a message of love and reassurance to Lucy. He successfully transitions this into a dinner date at the couple's anniversary spot. They get on with the cuckolding, and after a few sympathetic phrases, Lucy proves to be intensely interested in Frank's background. He explains that a car accident throttled his brain, allowing him to see ghosts. Ray tries to bring it back around by assuring her that he's going to stay in the house and will always take care of her. But with Frank's experience, he understands the pitfalls of that plan, and instead expresses to Lucy Ray's assertions that she should get on with her life and put him behind her. Frank then eliminates this annoyance with a quick elbow to the face before excusing himself to the restroom. While in there, he sees another man with a number on his forehead, and this time, the number is called in whilst Frank is present. After a gentle heart hug, this most recent victim finds himself chasing his mommy down a tunnel of light. Back at the station, it's revealed that there was a witness who saw Frank leave the bathroom shortly before the body was discovered. As a result, they are questioning Lucy as a material witness. Meanwhile, Frank is pursuing death in his old beater, continuing to use the whole town as his own personal bumper car track, despite the fact that, as everyone knows, you can't grasp the ethereal. Returning to the station, Lucy is introduced to Special Agent Dammers, a most peculiar and timid FBI agent who is compelled to vomiting at the slightest feminine provocation. Sheriff Perry offers a hand, but he's a bit of an odd bird. In an attempt to get her to turn on Frank, he reveals the details of their investigation into Frank's accident. The car wreck was the result of an argument about his choice of basketball hoop over Savory Garden, and it resulted in the death of his wife. She was found partially mutilated, indicating your boy is down with the sickness. Additionally, his personal and most treasured box cutter had been in the vehicular toolbox, but was never recovered. Back with the sausage crew, Stewart proves to be incredulous about the presence of the soul collector, despite the fact that they happen to be ghosts, and the party in question literally passed right through them. But bad omens abound, as the collector really starts getting his groove on. This time, Frank discovers the victim to be the reporter, watching as he breaststrokes up to heaven. This puts him at yet another scene of death. You're next and results in some very incriminating admissions. The police will not allow him to administer help. Thankfully, the judge waltzes in, six guns blazing, and drives that enrobed sucker out of the building. Feeling a bit high and randy after that arousing success, this crusty geezer starts extremely dry-humping Cleopatra. Then we learn that fleeing a museum is punishable by death. 
the police are distracted from their murderous intent by several ghostly happenings, thanks to Stuart and Cyrus. On his way out, we learn the Soul Collector can kill ghosts, Frank is not above sucker punching a woman, and that even when dizzy and disoriented, the police will just not stop shooting. Frank screams down the road, hoping to save his mortal enemy while giving death a run for his money, but he loses his nerve when he's confronted by his gravest error, and takes the car tumbling down a familiar cliff. Now face to face with Magda, he is unable to convince her of his good intentions, resulting in her imminent death. Luckily for him, sometimes souls get dragged through the tunnel even when they're not paying attention, so he doesn't have to face down her accusations for long. Frank then arrives at the station to turn himself in. He is dejected and feeling worthless, so he self-destructs, opting to burn it all down rather than attempt to convince others of the truth they can't see. He pushes away Lucy and prepares to take his medicine. In a legal sense, on the way home, Ray continues to be confused about why Lucy is ignoring him, presuming it to be related to his gooey complexion. It's not the reason, but he's also not wrong. Back in interrogation, Damers is all wound up and full of conflict now. He impresses us all with his vast history of investigations of the paranormal and occult. He's thinking that Frank is pulling all this off with his mind powers, and that his accusations of Death's hand being at work here is just a reference to the alter ego he dons when he's feeling particularly saucy and ready to murder. He's heading down this path because five years ago, Frank's wife was the first crushed heart victim. He's left to rot in the holding cell, where his ghost buddies come to learn that he's lost his gift of second sight due to his renewed lack of faith. And as he suffers, Damers, the little freak, peers in on him like a little rat. A rat with a periscope, obviously. Meanwhile, Lucy's gone to his house to see if she can make any sense of all this. She does find a decrepit old basketball hoop that has been transformed into a memorial garden. Her visit happens to coincide with an answering machine message from Ms. Bradley calling for Frank's help in driving an evil spirit out of her daughter. Lucy takes this up as her cross to bear and proceeds back to the cursed sanatorium. She enters the wretched home, which offers a much more ominous view to the spiritually attuned. She finds Patricia up in her room and very pleased to have a shoulder to cry on. She tries to be encouraging, Patricia, you have to get out of this house. But she's on conditional release. And then Miss Bradley returns, forcing Lucy to hide out in the closet, where she finds Frank's beloved box cutter. When the opportunity arises, she sneaks out quietly, while Ray sneaks in and promptly gets his face ripped off. Lucy finds her way back to the prison, where Frank is still sad, and plus he doesn't want her to get hurt. But through the healing power of love, he learns to believe again. And just in time to see the number gently glowing on her forehead, Cyrus and Stuart are are able to wrangle the Soul Collector for long enough to cover their escape, but at the cost of Stuart's afterlife. As they run off, they're held back by Dammers, who prepares to straight up execute Frank. Lucy plays like she's being safe, and leverages that to suffocate the agents in CO2. With Cyrus dying, they find themselves at the end of their rope. It becomes obvious to Frank now that he must leave this mortal coil in order to be able to effect any change. However, Lucy leverages her medical expertise to generate a safer idea. This will slow your heart rate and lower your body temperature. Okay, but will it kill him? He hunkers down for a good, never-ending sleep while Lucy prepares the rejuvenation equipment. Then Damers arrives, intending to allow Frank to continue dying forever, and then pulls his Uzi on a citizen. Frank discovers that every time you fall asleep, you may never wake up, and remembers that he's meant to save Lucy. She's being carted off in full view of death, so Frank just sort of flops his way through the air and somehow manages to intercept their pursuer before getting an assist from an 18-wheeler. Damers brings Lucy to the cemetery with the plan to hold her there for 11 hours. To what end, we don't know. He then overshares about how he spent way too long undercover in various cults, sans psychoval apparently, which is detrimental to one's well-being. He tells the story etched into his torso while she works to loosen her restraint. He aims to tap into the power of the mind, and the cruiser starts cruising, which he didn't even know that he wanted to do. So he's thinking he's hot shit, but it's really frank. Their retreat is thwarted by the sergeant's disregard for ghostly autonomy. He is hewn by death, who reaches Lucy, but is again held off by Frank. Lucy eventually breaks free, and Frank hangs back to pound his adversary's ectoplasm into pudding. He insists it answer for its crimes, even if it is now just a face flap. It's revealed to be old Johnny Bartlett, who is also the one carving up foreheads. He attempts to slip away, but Frank catches up, and they engage in a battle worthy of any PlayStation cutscene. Frank then very nearly scythes him to death, but is zapped back into existence. He warns Lucy that he failed, so she scurries off to go get Patricia. Upon arrival, she brings up the topic of the box cut 
better, sending both ladies off to settle things between themselves. Only Patricia comes back down and she admits that Johnny comes to torment her at night. He then arrives as a regular ghost now, and we hear that his motivation all this time has been to break various serial killer spree records. Patricia demonstrates an unusual enthusiasm for his plan as a tormented victim. She then leaves to get her jacket, but instead grabs a knife so the couple can play their little stabby sex games. Lucy, pressed on by the urgency, goes to retrieve Miss Bradley, only to find that Patty already done did it. A struggle ensues and Lucy manages to lock herself outside the room but is not yet safe as the carpet man comes back. But then Frank arrives and releases her. As they retreat, they get into an altercation with the painting, and when he pierces it on a bedpost, it's revealed that the nearby trophy actually contains Johnny's remains. Now, everyone knows you can only neutralize such an artifact by taking it to hallowed ground, so they go searching for the sanatorium's chapel for consecration. But along the way, they must also avoid the shotgun-wielding Patricia. Plus, after they split up, Dammers arrives as well, and it really cramps up the vibe. Lucy ends up stuck in an elevator and lucks out that Frank finds her first. He takes the ashes and accidentally catapults them into Dammer's greasy little fingers. He then immediately releases them before spraying Frank a little bit to teach him a lesson. With the end in sight, Frank relies on the power of holes to save himself and solve one of his three problems. He goes straight through to the basement where Lucy meets him and then Patty meets them. Frank then releases a repressed memory that shows his wife was the pair's first post-mortem victim after Patty's release from jail. Apparently a crime of opportunity that presented itself as they partook in a vigorous hike. Now out of ammo, the pair seeks to enact the perfect murder, looking to vivisect Lucy with a pickaxe. But a newly deceased Frank hops in and snatches her soul clean out of her meat suit, and he didn't even know he could do that. Then he drags her up to heaven, forcing Johnny to follow. Another novel discovery. They all make it all the way, and the two spree killers are feeling like real cocks of the walk, until the tunnel turns molten and they're penetrated in every orifice by the devil's tendrils. Then old Debbie Bannister rolls up with Cyrus and Stewart, and just to say hi, you know, to make sure she still got it, but then tells him that it's not his time, so he dutifully goes back to Earth and agrees to spend his life with Lucy now as his new wife. Man, there really was a lot riding on their assumption that she would be agreeable to that outcome. Now, as we get a little deeper into the details, I wanted to reiterate that this is the director's cut. It has a full 13 extra minutes of footage and clocks in at two hours. I would hope that nothing is left unexplained, but let's see. To clarify a point of confusion when I was first watching, the glowing numbers are reminiscent of the number that was carved into Frank's wife's forehead, because Johnny Bartlett's MO was to carve his victims up with a number representing their place in his sequence of killings. His ultimate goal was to rack up enough kills to sit atop Mount Serial Killer, and he would constantly reference which real-life killers the pair was outpacing as their body count grew. Now, what he felt about the legitimacy of this contest, given the unfairness of him being able to continue his spree in perpetuity, whereas other killers would be limited by their biological lifespan, is unknown. I referenced early on the idea that the cemetery was bad or scary to Cyrus and Stuart and that Frank warns Ray about this as well. I didn't come back to that specifically because the movie never came back to it either. It's unclear what the issue was with the cemetery. Maybe it was just that the sergeant would try to keep them there as part of his duties so they wouldn't be able to bounce around and have fun. But then Cyrus and Stewart indicated they needed Frank so they could stay away. It's unclear. Further information about the ghosts, because their relationship with the material world was unusual and inconsistent. The physics of the ghosts were that they were able to do or not do whatever was necessary for the plot at any given moment to keep things moving. There was not much time examining the rules of this universe because, despite the long runtime, the film really didn't let up. There was not a lot of extra time to squeeze in other stuff. They probably could have showed things that would clarify some of the rules to make it quicker, but there was really a lot of story in there. There's also not a lot of information that helps elucidate the psychology of Dammers. He had a deep sense of nationalism from serving his country so intently. He started out undercover in a sex cult where he sacrificed the sanctity of his body to get in good with the elders. From there, it was undercover with one pack of psychos after another, over and over and over again. This took its toll on him over time. There isn't much else to justify his behavior, other than that he was a complete weirdo. He had a Nazi vibe and had a swastika tattooed on his palm, but I believe the intent here is to show how deep he went undercover. All the markings on his body were earned over time from the various cases he worked, and his ultimate motivation was service of his country. The situation with his interactions with strong women seemed to just be a quirk likely a piece of psychological baggage picked up along the way somewhere. So with that explained to the degree it can or needs to be, we're left with quite a few questions. 
Aside from the cemetery concerns, which were mentioned just a moment ago, there is also the question of ghost clothing and accessories. Cyrus complained about being stuck in a bygone era of fashion due to when he died. However, the sergeant changed his look completely and even formed a couple of large guns. Also, the judge had a gun as well. Where do ghost guns come from, and why do they hurt other ghosts? Also, if it's a projection of the individual ghost, how come Frank uses them later? And if they were conjured by Frank, why don't they all keep doing that all the time? Like a ghostly Green Lantern. If they can interact with matter, and sometimes matter interacts with them, why no errant interactions? Sometimes they accidentally got run over by a truck, but the reverse was never true. No one got bowled over by a ghost running at full speed, and no one ever accidentally got their melon split wide open by a random ghost bullet. Seems like that would happen every once in a while, especially with the sergeant spraying like he do. Finally, I do wonder what the deal was with Johnny. Why was he so capable of killing humans and other ghosts the way he did when he was the soul collector? But then, when he lost that role, he couldn't do much. He did escape hell, so maybe that was just an upgrade from his time there? It's also not clear how this ties into the concept of frighteners. Surely Frank and the ghosts are frighteners in their own right, but the judge also mentions how Frank should be wary of frighteners later. So what are they? Realistically, we could probably go on forever, but these questions are mostly just for fun because the movies sought to represent a more slapstick view of ghost society than anything else. The point wasn't to lay out all these specific details, and if you as the movie maker don't think these things out beforehand, you're likely to generate contradictory actions that just raise a buttload of questions. On the plus side, this movie has that free kinetic non-stop Peter Jackson energy that was present in his earlier films. It really does come at you pretty much non-stop for most of its runtime. Even though it seemed like it was trying to do too much at times, it did present some interesting ideas and applications of supernatural mythology. It was also intended to be a PG-13 movie, but the MPAA would not stop giving it an R rating. That's how we ended up with such a long director's cut and some extra gore. If they weren't going to reduce the rating, Jackson decided to add some elements to make it feel like it earned the rating, and also decided to stop making and unnecessary cuts for the sake of reducing the rating, since it wasn't going to happen. And who should watch it? Most likely people nostalgic about this time period. It is very dated and has a particular feel to it. If you're a fan of 13 Ghosts, you're likely going to enjoy this one as well. The cover does make a promise that isn't really held up in the movie, and this is for people looking for goofy fun. And like I said, it doesn't necessarily feel like it earned its R rating at times. So that part's a bit of a misdirect. This would also be a good transitional horror for younger folks looking to take a step toward that next level. It came out one year after Casper and is essentially an R-rated version of that. Although I'm not sure if today's youngsters will think much of the subpar computer animations, given what they're used to. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.